Well, good morning. We're here at the California Antiquarian Book Fair, February 9th, 2020. And we're sitting down this morning with Glenn Mason, welcome, Thank of you. Cultural Images yes. in Portland, Oregon. Yes. And we are here to hear the story of you and the story of the business. I'm excited to, to hear about it. Um, tell us first a little bit about where you were born and where you grew up, family life, parents. Be glad to. Oh, good. Actually, I'm proud because I'm oh. from the little town of Mendocino in Northern California. Okay. So if anybody has ever watched Murder, She Wrote with <gasps> Angela Lansbury, yeah. her house, theoretically in Cabot Cove, Maine, is a house that I grew up in. Oh my so gosh. So it's an old Victorian house. And actually, growing up in Mendocino is part of who I am and what I do. Okay. Um, my mom is from an old family, an old New England family, the Adams family, with all their uh, Adams connections. Do, 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 do. My dad was from the Mason family, from the old Virginia Mason side of the oh family. So goodness. we had a lot of history, and the family was always interested in history. Wow. Then growing up in the Redwood Coast in Northern California, I became very interested in the early logging industry, the interrelationship between the tribes and the oh. uh, settlers that came there. I went to college, I graduated from Mendocino. The, the little, we have 36 people in our graduating class, the largest graduating class ever in Mendocino High School. Oh my gosh. The previous one was 1930. My parents were in that one together. Oh. Um, so I went what's to Humboldt. What's that mascot, Glenn? Just, excuse what's, me? What's the mascot? The Cardinal. All right, go Cardinals. Uh, yeah, go Cardinals, yeah. <laughs> then I went to Humboldt State, and I went through a number of majors. You know, I started out at pre-pharmacy, and then I had a chemistry lab or a chemistry class lecture at 7 in the morning. Oof. And I got an A in the lab, I got a D in the course, which tells you how I did in the <laughs> lecture part of it. Yeah. So then I switched to English. Okay. And I can still quote Bon Appetit, Woody Shorty, Sote, the Drought of Rain, Pierce of the Rote. Wow. Um, then I switched to phys ed. I was going to be a coach. Okay. And then I went to law enforcement. And then I decided, and by that time I was married, had a, two kids. I said, I really need to get out of college. And so I looked around. What's the easiest thing to get out of? It was history. Oh. So I completed a degree in history at Humboldt. And didn't know what I wanted to do. Didn't want to teach necessarily. And mm -hmm. what else do you do with history? And yeah. uh, I was volunteering at the special collections at the Humboldt State College at that time, now a university. Um, the woman said, the, the curator there said, well, why don't you go to library school? And I go, oh my God, I, why would I want to go to library <laughs> yeah, school? Yeah, that sounds. You know, <laughs> And she said, no, 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 just go to the University of Oregon, interview or meet the dean. And so I said, okay, nothing to lose. So I drove up to Eugene, Oregon, University of Oregon. And it just so happened, the serendipity, mm -hmm. the morning I met with the dean, he had just gotten notice that they had received a grant from the government that they wanted to take 20 people that had a background in history to do a library science degree in archival librarianship. And usually that those in those days, this was in the 60s, and that time those people were being trained at like Denver and some of those kind of places, usually through traditional program. Mm -hmm. They wanted to see what would happen if you had history people go into archives. In, and so I got paid $500 a month. This was in 1969, wow. a graduate student. $500 a month, free tuition and whatever oh to get an MLS goodness. in archive. Right. Yeah. And so we all, there were 20 of us in the class, um, came down to the Bay Area for a summer session, and I got farmed out to site at California Pioneers. Other people went to Bancroft or the Wells Fargo History Room or wherever. So coming back then to Eugene, uh, there was a position open at the uh, little museum there, mm -hmm. a county museum, historical museum. So I applied, nothing else to do. So got the position and became a museum administrator then the rest of my professional career. Wow. So I was in Eugene for about 12 years, went up to Spokane, Washington, was the head of the Eastern Washington State Historical Society up there. In Washington, there are two state historical societies rather than just one. And was there until 1999, then retired, moved back to Portland and started Cultural Images. Oh and to goodness. begin with, Cultural Images um, well, first of all, you have to understand that cultural images is really me and my wife, Judith. Mm -hmm. And Judith is a big part of what I do and what we do together. Mm -hmm. Cultural images comes from our combined interest in working with cross-culturally mm -hmm. with various communities, communities of color, economic stratas or whatever. That came out of our museum experiences where we wanted museums to be open to everybody, not just the elite. Um, 
And so we decided that we would use the term cultural images because it related to that, but it also related to my interest in vintage photography, which mm -hmm. I had collected for a long time, and in um, imagery like ephemera, the graphics of mm -hmm. ephemera. So cultural images sounded like a combined title or mm -hmm. name of the business. Um, we came to Portland, did a lot of consulting with tribes and with historical societies and museums regarding building special collections. Um, then after about 10 years of that, we decided, you know, I've always wanted to play with this stuff, but mm -hmm. never had a chance to because I was always the administrator. Administrators get to raise money and that's yeah. about it. They don't get to play with the stuff. So now I'm playing with the stuff that I've always enjoyed. So all the way back to the beginning, yeah. uh, when I was in archival librarianship and I loved ephemera mm -hmm. and the stories that ephemera tells, yeah. manuscript material, vintage photography. So those are the real specialties that we do now. And besides books for me are, are at, at age 75, they're a little bit heavy to carry around and pack around. I hear you. Paper can be a little bit easier. To I hear you, with. absolutely. Yeah. That sounds incredible, better than I expected to even hear. Uh, there's just so much that we could talk about. Um, so you, I don't have to ask what attracted you to the book or the paper business because it's a part of you. Yes. It's a part of your academic expression yeah. and clearly a part of you and Judith's passion for learning about right. the community around you, the yeah. world at large. Yeah, the important thing for us is mm -hmm. the context. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, if, if you looked at our inventory, we have pieces that are like $5 and pieces that are, you know, four figures or whatever, but it, it's not the dollar value. Mm -mm. Having been in the museum world all of our lives, we never really thought too much about dollar value. Yeah. It was always, what, can, what are the stories that that mm -hmm. object or that piece of paper can tell? Absolutely. And so for us, it's the context that's important. Mm -hmm. So most of our inventory has a story to tell and the pieces that we have are just the objects to help tell that story. Yeah. So that's what we like to do. Yeah, yeah. If it's an icon and there's a story beneath yes. the story. Absolutely. I call that also the work beneath the work, right. which it sounds like you're really doing, um, hearing about outreach and drawing in uh, the people whose stories you're telling mm -hmm. instead of coming from like a top-down yeah. narrative. One of the things Kara, that people, so we do uh, periodic lists and whatever that we send out. Mm -hmm. They tend to be verbose, as people will tell us. And, uh, but part of that is who we are because rather than just say this is X, Y, Z mm -hmm. and this is the date it was and yeah. whatever, we try to place it in some sort of context so that even if people don't buy it, if they read the descriptions, which tend to be a little long, mm -hmm. they perhaps can come away knowing something a little bit more, even though it wasn't something of interest to them. That's so, so that's part of our whole, that's it's, why we're, we're doing this. It's generous. Yeah, it's a reflection well. of who you both are as humans. And we bring a lot of us to this business. Yeah, and it's very generous. And, you know, you're a teacher at, at heart, it mm -hmm. sounds like. And teaching with your material. Speaking of teaching and that generosity, mm -hmm. um, as you moved through the academic and then into administrative facets, you got to know a lot of people and then you segued into it as a business. Who are some of the people who were doing what you thought you may wanna do or who do what you are also okay. doing? Who are you aligned with in this business that? Uh, there's a lot of them. But there are. Yeah. Actually, probably one of the first people, my mother, who was, who was the avid historian of our family mm. and uh, who really, I think, probably helped nurture my interest in, in history and the stories of history of history because she introduced me to all the, well, when I was a, when I was a kid, I made my summer money or my, my, my spending money by cutting lawns for all the old widows that lived in Mendocino. So these were women in their 70s, 80s, 90s, yeah. who had experienced the logging industry, whatever, and they would bring out their old photographs and they would tell oh, all wow. these stories. And as a young kid, I loved to listen to that. So my mom helped foster all of that. Then there was, a, there was one class I remember at Humboldt State where they introduced us to some first person narratives. And all of a sudden, kind of like that light bulb comes on where if you're reading a diary or if you're reading a, a memoir or something actually written by the person, it's as if that person is talking directly to you. Absolutely. And so that connection to history becomes like, you're mm -hmm. right there, mm -hmm. like you and I are talking, that's reading. Yeah. It, it's, mm -hmm. and, and I really appreciated the professor that, that did that. When I, 
the, going to the museum world, we met a lot of folks, you know, people like uh, John Reps, you know, who did mm -hmm. all the, um, the, the wonderful pictorial views and the, and the bird's eye views, that sort of thing. And a lot of Getzman and a lot of those kind of, of, of scholars. But when I joined the Ephemera Society, that's probably when I really met some folks that I really do admire. And I already and know it. That's the Ephemera Society of America, of America for people yes. who may not know. Yes, yeah. And, uh, yeah, they can yeah. look that and, up. And those are people like like Cheryl Yeager, mm -hmm. who's going to be what, vice president this year mm -hmm. of ABAA. Um, and uh, but before that, people like Jeff Carr and Bruce Shire and some mm -hmm. of those kind of folks who handled the kind of material that I had an affinity for. But then you go back and see the people on the East Coast, which I had never really met before. And, and there are the James Arsenals of the world and all mm -hmm. those folks, the Peter Lukes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and it's like, wow, this whole world is just out there and, and you never know what you're gonna see or what you're gonna find. Mm -hmm. yeah. But looking for those stories, uh, I, uh, letting their voice come through. It, you do that so well. Yeah, thank you. Uh, from whatever decade, whatever era, it's bringing them to life again. And um, it's really incredible work that you do. How do you, you know, as far as the well, business? I do have to tell you one more thing. Oh, I didn't want to tell because, yeah. because he, he actually came through yesterday. Who's that? Michael Heaston. Michael Heaston. And it's okay. like Judith on her side of the bed has the New Yorker magazines yeah. stacked high. Yeah. I have Michael Heaston's catalogs. You know, they may be 15, 20, 30 years old. I'm still going through those. I read them and I read them and I read them. Wow. That's all right. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. Um, so in, in that trade setting, um, you talk about his catalog. Mm -hmm. How are you showing the world your stories? You talked about, are you yeah. doing e-lists, catalogs? Clearly you're doing fairs, website. How do you get those stories seen? You're yeah. telling it and you're writing it, but. Right now it's primarily through catalogs and, okay. and e-lists uh, mm -hmm. going out and, and obviously the, the, the physical presence um, and one of the primary reasons that ABAA was of interest to me is the connection that we can make with institutional folks and that mm -hmm. is really important that face-to-face -face interaction is really important mm -hmm. we can do things online or whatever but it's really impersonal and until you really get to meet those folks it's uh, something we're kind of, I am uh, technically old fashioned. I say I'm a number two pencil kind of guy. Uh -huh. um, and so a lot of the new social media that's out there that's available to people that I know that a lot of the younger book dealers and ephemera dealers are uh, using those, those platforms. We haven't yet. Um, we've, we've often talked about doing a website. We haven't done that yet. You know, and maybe at our age, um, do we need to do that? Exactly. We're having fun doing what we're doing. Mm -hmm. We don't have the largest of inventories, but um, we just enjoy it. And I want to enjoy. I don't want it to make it too much work. Mm -hmm. I want it to be. I want to work. Yeah. Uh, but I want it to be fun doing yeah. it. So awesome. We do what we do. It. So the old-fashioned way. I mean, I I love looking at people's catalogs. Any time a dealer like at this fair brings yeah. a catalog, it's just. Ah, it's a treasure. It's when you read that. And you can hold it and you can read you it can, on the plane or the train home. And you can absolutely. Look, keep yeah. it on your nightstand yeah. so that that physical object. That's one of the things we learned actually with the list is that because my descriptions are very long, very mm -hmm. often, um, we try not to put any more than 20 or 25 up at one time because I think it, even when you're looking at a computer, no matter how interested you are in a subject matter, there's a certain time period where it's kind of yeah. like, okay, yeah. I'll move on to the next thing. Especially when so, it's not in your hand. Yeah. yeah. So what we try to do is is to capture as many images of whatever it is we're talking about, along with the verbal descriptions, to be able to try to yeah. hold people's attention at least for a little while. Mm -hmm. yeah. I don't call that long. Let's call that information dense, information yeah. generous. Yes, <laughs> you were sharing a lot yeah. of you and your yeah. unique perspective on the material. Um, so catalog sounds, you know, like a great place for that. If um, if you were entering well, the well, trade... Well, with the catalog here, one of the interesting things, I mean, I think um, part of dealing with manuscript material and ephemera material, yeah. as well as books, I'm sure, it's a continual a learning process. Oh, yeah. And so, like, I, we just did a catalog in, in connection with another ABA member, Ken Harris, and it, and it was on the Alaska Yukon. Oh. And um, so I did the catalog. A lot of it was his material, but I did all the catalog descriptions. What I learned from that, mm -hmm. it's just, I mean, and that's the joy to me. I Absolutely. learned something, and can we pass that learning on to somebody else? Mm -hmm. so. Yeah, we're, we're transferring information that only we have in that moment. 
um, such good stuff. If if you uh, were entering the trade, even going back to your academic trade mm. today, um, what what do you find some of the challenges to be now? And what do you what you know if if the young cultural images company uh, was entering right now, how would would you do something different? Would you do it the same? What do you think some of the challenges? Yeah. We have information overload. You know, we have we sometimes have reading fatigue. Um, what's the future look like? Challenges and joys. Yeah, the future is always unknown. But I, I think that um, sometimes perhaps we get stuck too much in the areas that we like mm -hmm. and forget. I mean, some of us do it both for the pleasure that we derive out of it, but it also is a business and it yeah. is um, something that we have to pay attention to. And I think sometimes I'm guilty of it myself. I like 19th century material much better than 20th century material. But when you look at the audience attendance and you see a lot of folks who are in their 70s and 80s and you're thinking, oh, wait a minute now, oh. 10 years from now, where are these people gonna be? Mm -hmm. And where is that newer group? So I think a lot of it needs to pay more attention to what are the interests and what are the um, aptitudes that the younger generations have? Mm -hmm. What is it that will attract them? One of the nice things about graphics is that um, the actual graphic design and the imagery is attractive to a lot of the younger people. Yeah, and we're absolutely. finding that uh, there's a show in the Bay Area that we do. It's a, it, it's free to the public. It's at Golden Gate Park, and mm -hmm. so a lot of people just stroll in. And in the in in the Bay Area, there are a lot of graphic designers, and they see ephemera and they go, "Wow, and look at that design!" Mm -hmm. And and at some point, those folks who are who are looking at it and buying it for the design potential may also then become the collectors and the stewards of the of yeah. that material in the future. Yeah, I want to go back to some of these unique places where you sit and it's that visual material. We are becoming a more visual culture yes. and uh, textually deficient, perhaps. Um, in that vein also, going back to the photographs mm -hmm. and going back to how that connects to the stories you're telling about tribes and the communities that mm -hmm. are in that history of your right. region, the Pacific Northwest. Or who's um, not in that image. Who's not in the image, that's, right. I mean, to me, who's not represented is maybe more important than who is represented. Okay, that's, Because those are the untold that. stories. Yeah. yeah. So how do you look to uh, tell those untold stories and shine a light there? You know, that's, that's to me why you need to put things in context. Mm -hmm. So you can see an image of a logger on a springboard cutting down a tree but does it tell you about who he is and why he is on that springboard as opposed to setting a choker in the woods mm -hmm. or greasing the skids for an oxen? And then you begin, as you get into it, you find out that because of your nationality, your, your position in the woods has a hierarchy. So mm -hmm. if you're a Chinese descent in the 1860s working in the redwoods, you're going to be greasing the skids for the oxen because that's the most dangerous job. Mm -hmm. You are an expendable commodity. Mm -hmm. Then the next is would be the Portuguese or the Italians who are working. They're using jack screws, which are the, you know, the, the mechanisms that turn the logs over to get them to where you want them to go before you hook them up to the oxen. The jack screw slips or whatever, log rolls back on, you're killed, mm. but you're expendable. And then you get up to who's on the springboard, who's cutting the tree, and that's the, you know, the Anglo, and then who's the mm. mill owner, and so all those kind of stories. And so when you see one photograph, mm -hmm. you can begin to say, okay, here is a segment, but where else is going on, and what don't you see behind the background, and who's all a part of that, and how does that one image fit within all of that? So photographs to me are, you know, they're wonderful, but you have to like you have to take them, not necessarily with a grain of salt, but you really have to think about why is that image being taken? Yeah. Is it staged? Is it not staged? Mm -hmm. um, you know, what's going on? But who's not there? I don't know that many of us think about that when we look at it. Yeah. We we take it for face value, but be, you're telling a story and teaching us all to kind of look at these things yeah. with X-ray vision, cultural X-ray vision, maybe. Yeah. You know, in the domestic world, in the industrial world. Right. Yeah, the, the 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 unseen image that's powerful. I'm just you know we're lucky to have yeah. uh, a but voice like yours telling that, us these that's things. That's why I think that that um, snapshots, <laughs> yeah. as an example, are becoming so popular because people aren't doing it for a, a monetary incentive. They're not taking they're not taking a photograph thinking uh, 
I'm going to document this business because the business owner is going to buy it and use yeah. it to reproduce in their publications, which means you're not going to show, you know, the bad parts of the industry. Yeah. So a snapshot, a candid snapshot is just showing this is what it is, folks, and mm -hmm. all the, you know, nonsense or whatever. Mm -hmm. That's what it is. I think the that's a real parts, interest in that. The truth. Yeah. yeah. Oh, that's that's incredible. So that sounds like uh, your finger really is on the pulse of what the future of the trade is as far as interest, because, you know, photography and graphical images, that's that's to me where where we're going. And I think you're well appointed for as yeah. long into the future as you want to be. One of the things about imagery and, and manuscript material and that sort of thing is that um, many of those are unique. Yeah, um, you know, a photograph, a snapshot probably is unique very often, unless you made umpteen copies to send to yeah. all your relatives. Manuscript is there's only one of those. Mm -hmm. here. Um, w books um, are a little bit more finite. I mean, mm -hmm. you most people know how many are out there, or how, you know about the value and all that sort of thing. Ephemera, since it's a relatively new field, means that people are finding things every day that they've never seen before. Yeah. Uh, and no matter, and geographic is really interesting because we're on the West Coast. Mm -hmm. You know, West Coast, if, if it's 1850s, it's old out here. Yeah. You know, you go back East and it's like, you know, big deal, mm -hmm. 1850s. Yeah. So um, it's really interesting, all that out there that no one knows about yet. It keeps us excited. Still to be discovered. It keeps yeah. us hungry. Absolutely. Keeps us, Absolutely. you know, yeah. curious yeah. And, and hopefully keeps us in business too. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, good luck to you and Judith. Thank you. I really am thankful for you sharing all that with us today. Thank you, Karen. Yeah. yeah.